Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's AEW Dynamite Review Show here on the unofficial WWE Podcast. My name is Mimi Burris, and you guessed it, we are talking about last night's episode of Dynamite Fighter Fest. A whole lot to get into, a really good show overall, I thought. So we're going to talk about all the good stuff and a few of the things that we can probably pick apart here and there. So we'll get into all of it right after this. a little sweet on Christian Cage, if you know what I mean. The AEW Women's Champion, Thunder Rosa. Nobody is on my level. The TBS Champion. Nobody better in the world. Does this go hot? I want you to fire me. You f- Alright everybody, I hope you have all had a wonderful week this week, and we are going to get right into the show real quick. I'm going to plug Patreon as always, 99 cents a month, or you can subscribe on iTunes as well, uh, and you can get, not iTunes, Apple Podcasts, whatever the hell we are on. You can subscribe there as well and get all of these shows completely ad-free, so what are you waiting for? Join the family, Uh, a whole bunch of benefits and stuff that come along with that, so jump right in. Uh, and let's jump right into the AEW Dynamite Fighter Fest uh, show last night. That I thought, like I said, was a really good show overall. We're going to kick it off real quick right away with a TNT Championship match, which was Wardlow versus Orange Cassidy. And um, at first sight, I was surprised that they booked this match. I, I didn't know why they were doing this. I thought Orange Cassidy is so over, Wardlow is so over right now. And AEW has a habit of... Not not booking good matches. That's not what I mean at all. But AEW has a highlight. A uh, highlight. Uh, a AEW has a um, a way of booking matches that basically usually we know who's going to be the winner and uh, putting one star over over somebody who's a lesser star, and which isn't a bad format and it works and that's why AEW always goes to it. But we rarely see matches like this with two guys that are so over and uh, not that the result was in doubt at all, but uh, they definitely got a bunch of great near falls. So, yeah, I mean, this was really awesome. Basically, the story of this match, Orange Cassidy, he said it in the the uh, promo before the, or during the entrance, they were going to cheat. And uh, they <laughs> tried to cheat for sure, but Wardlow came off as a super smart baby face here. Uh, with one, the the tennis racket or whatever it was, a bat, something, uh, that Trent tried to bring into the ring. And then there was a uh, chainsaw uh, from Chuck. I, I said that so casually. There was a freaking chainsaw. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they both got kicked out, although they were allowed to be there because they got their official managerial license. And I really did like that uh, little touch there. So... Their outfits are freaking ridiculous, and Hangman Page was wearing something kind of similar. So, yeah, that was that was something else as well. But anyways, without uh, without going into that and sticking on this match, uh, so Wardlow, the smart baby face, didn't fall for that. Didn't fall for a lot of the chicanery and the uh, you know bells and whistles of the Orange Cassidy act at first, at least. Didn't fall for Danhausen on the outside. Uh, all really good stuff to put over Wardlow. It's just a smart baby face. Uh, and Orange Cassidy did his whole thing in the beginning of the match, hands in the pockets, Wardlow ripping the pockets, I popped for that, Wardlow ripping the pockets right out of, uh, well, out of Orange Cassidy's pants, and, uh, this was, uh, after, after we had all the chicanery and the, all the, uh, I keep using that word, all the chicanery and all the, uh, bells and whistles and all of the other, you know, fun stuff of this match, overall, this was actually a really well-wrestled match, Orange, Ca- Orange Cassidy, uh, wrestling as the underdog and uh, the little man against the big man, obviously. But the big man not coming off like a heel, Wardlow. Uh, but I really liked, you know, on the outside, Wardlow was about to get slammed into the post. No, but he just reversed that because he's much bigger than Orange Cassidy. And Orange Cassidy going through all these moves, there was a really good uh, reversal of, I think it was a Huracarana, Wardlow cartwheeled out of it. I'm trying not to swear because I'm not trying to make more work for myself on this podcast, but he cartwheeled the f-, f out of it. 
was unbelievable. This man is so good at sprinkling little things that he can do in the ring, like the senton. Now we get the cartwheel out of a huracrana. Little athletic, beautiful things that he can do. And I know there is so much more in the uh, the locker. Even if he doesn't have more in the locker, he's convinced me that he does. So I'm excited and more excited to watch every Wardlow match coming up. But this was different from most Wardlow matches, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, it was a wrestled as a competitive match, and Orange Cassidy really did get a bunch of close near falls. He kicked out of the F10, the first person in AEW to kick out of the F10. So, uh, but Wardlow ended up getting a power bomb, only one power bomb, but you knew once it happened, the match was going to be over, and got the victory. And yeah, this was such a fun way to kick off the show. Um, it was his first real challenge, I thought. And uh, and he proved that he could wrestle a real match outside of just his regular squashes. Not that I, I really think that the match against Scorpio Sky was more of a glorified squash match with again more bells and whistles. But this was a this was a really fun match that also provided a really good wrestling match as as it's in itself. On top of that, on top of just being a good time. And Wardlow showed that he can hang. He can hang in a match that isn't just a squash match. So um, not it wasn't super long, but it wasn't definitely long form in comparison to Wardlow's other matches. Uh, and I don't think Orange Cassidy lost anything from this. In fact, I actually think he won in a loss. Uh, and he had a victory in a loss where he got over even more because of this match. And there was a show of respect after the match as well, uh, which was really nice. So two awesome uh, performances from both men. And a strong match overall, and I have nothing to complain about. Um, uh, real quick, guys, before we get into the Chris Jericho promo, I want to quickly talk about Excalibur during this entire show. And just in general, Excalibur, just unbelievable commentary. The man knows every single move that has ever been done ever before in every lifetime ever. Like, he can, I, he, there were some moves, like, during the Serena Deeb match and the Serena Deeb and Anna Jade match that I didn't know, Anna Jade, excuse me, that I didn't know even existed, and he's calling out, you know, I, I can't even remember what the names were, but I just want to give all the credit to Excalibur throughout this entire night, especially. I thought he did a really good job on commentary, so... All right, Chris Jericho comes out, talks about how everybody who's ever been friends with Eddie Kingston uh, basically ends up uh, being a loser, gets their head shaved, gets uh, their hand broken, all that stuff. He talked about how Eddie Kingston is not a liar, and he's not a liar either. Eddie Kingston is a loser, though. Uh, and then we got a quick backstage response from Eddie Kingston, uh, just doing an incredible promo, as Eddie Kingston always does, with Ruby Soho and... Uh, and Ortiz in the background as well with the shaved head and the broken hand. And basically just more blood talk, more blood, blood, blood talk. And I'm excited for this match next week. I, I thought the promo was good. It wasn't Chris Jericho's best promo ever. I definitely think I've seen better to put over other matches better, especially during that inner circle pinnacle feud. Uh, I've seen better from Chris Jericho, but this wasn't bad by any means. It just wasn't it wasn't a plus 10 out of 10 for me. Um, though Eddie Kingston's promo, I thought was, you know, Eddie Kingston always shoots a nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 on his promo. So I thought Eddie Kingston's like two minute response was so much better than uh, Chris Jericho's entire promo. Uh, and then we got the match for the interim, uh, world heavyweight championship eliminator match, uh, or I forget what they call it. Exactly. John Moxley versus Kanosuke. I, I always mess up this name. Kanosuke Takeshita. I know I get the last name right. I'm not so sure about the first name. But uh, I want to put respect on his name, really, because this guy has been showing up and showing out, especially on Rampage against Eddie Kingston. Big ranting and raving about that match. People all over. I still actually have to watch that match. I have not watched Rampage from last week. I, I just haven't had the time yet. But I heard uh, all good things about that match. And then there was the match against Hangman Page that stuck out to me. It was a really good match. And this was no different. Different for sure in a way where the match was uh, definitely wrestled a lot different. But uh, just another great match and another great showing from Takeshka. Um, so John Moxley basically beating the crap out of him. Uh, you know, biting him. At one point he got busted open in this match. I think John Moxley had a bloody nose or something too. Or it's just Takeshka's blood. I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, but John Moxley... Uh, ending up winning by submission on Takesha after pile drivers, after these guys punched each other over and over again. They basically beat the crap out of each other. And uh, Takesha's baby face, like, just uh, comeback spots were incredible. Uh, overall, I really have no complaints about this either. I really enjoyed this match. And you know what? 
Takeshka is so fast. When he runs the ropes, this guy is so fast. You can't even keep up with him. And it makes everything he does look so much more intense because the guy gets such power behind his punches, his kicks, that awesome flip forearm thing that he did. Uh, there was a suplex off the top rope at one point that looked really good from John Moxley to Takeshka. Uh, so overall, I really, really, like I said, I really enjoyed this, and I had a, I had a great time watching it, and it made me feel, and that's the theme of this episode of Dynamite. It made me feel things, especially the main event. We're gonna talk about that as well, of course. But yeah, um, I felt for Takeshka. I was on his side. I wasn't rooting against John Moxley, but I was rooting for him. And yeah, there were some really good near falls in this match as well. So this definitely had a different flavor than the first match. We have the AEW buffet beginning once again, and. Uh, like I said, overall, no complaints. So, uh, Next up, we had Luchasaurus and Griff Garrison, or versus Griff Garrison. But first, we had the Christian Cage promo. Basically coming out, talking about how uh, the low-hanging fruit of Brian Pillman's dad. He didn't go in. I, I was expecting something more along the lines of methany, but he uh, he didn't, I guess, sink to MJF's level on that, uh, on that line, at least. But he definitely did come out uh, quick. Quick promo, quick match, basically Luchasaurus, which, by the way, I am loving Dark Luchasaurus. I love the aesthetic. I love the music. I love the black mask. I love the whole thing. Um, But he came out and uh, beat the crap out of Griff Garrison and then uh, won with two choke slams, a pinfall, and then put him and Brian Pillman through the uh, announce table. Uh, it looked like it hurt like absolute hell because uh, the first choke slam didn't break the table, and the second time, uh, breaking the table and with a little more force behind it. So, uh, yeah, I yeah, I'm really loving this Christian Cage character with the tor- turtlenecks. I'm loving uh, the um, dark Luchasaurus. I think he's got such an aura around him and a great aesthetic, and I think that. Uh, I really think that they could push him beyond this. Like, I really love this pairing. I, I didn't think it was... I wasn't sure if it was going to work at first. Here we are. I want to see Luchasaurus go up up against maybe Wardlow for the TNT title. I think that would be a great match. Definitely, he's racking up the wins. So, we could see that coming in. I want Chris Jericho and Luchasaurus to run with this for a little while before Jungle Boy gets back. Um, it was a weird... Thing with Griff Garrison, I forgot to mention where they like said something about how he looked like Jungle Boy. I, I didn't get that at first, but I, I guess I get it now. I, I see it, obviously, right? I see the hair, the curly hair, and the same similar body types and all of that. But um, I assume Griff Garrison is a little bit taller and bigger than Jungle Boy, but uh, still got the crap beat out of him. So, all right. Speaking of beating the crap out of people, uh, Claudio Castagnoli versus Jake Hager. Yes, these guys laid it in, and I think this match, maybe I could have cut off two minutes of it, but it was pretty perfect timing as well, and it was the crowd was really, really up for it. Uh, Blackpool, Blackpool Combat Club, uh, R- William Regal, excuse me, coming out with Claudio, and uh, Jericho Appreciation Society not coming out with Jake Hager, but coming out later on in the match to help try to make the distraction my favorite part about this match was, yes, the uppercuts, because they look awesome every single time. I can't even deny it. But my real favorite part of this match was that they teased you that they were going to do the WWE finish, where someone hops on the rope, the person gets distracted some way, somehow, and gets out of the submission move that they're in for some reason, rather than just continuing. It's not like if they get hit in the face, they're going to win by disqualification. So I don't know why they get up and move. But gets up, moves, Claudia goes to go punch, uh, I think it was Angelo. Parker, except when they we get a great near fall from Jake Hager hitting something like a, a side effect or something of that nature, a rock bottom. But yes, we get a great near fall, and then Claudio ends up getting the win anyways, despite the distractions, despite the JAS trying to interfere. It was really a good play on a good trope, and I thought they did a... With with such a WWE match, right, we got Jake Hager, We the People, and Claudio Cascagnoli, Cesario, and Jack Swagger. And they played with this uh, really awesome trope that, you know, the distraction finish, and essentially didn't go that way. Claudio got the win, and I really liked that. I talked about his uppercuts. I think Jake Hager looks phenomenal, uh, in phenomenal shape, and... Uh, and I'm really interested to see 
Uh, what's next for the JAS after this whole Eddie Kingston thing? I'm excited to see what's next for Blackpool Combat Club as well and Claudio Castagnoli. I assume we're going to get the feud with Eddie Kingston maybe at some point, or maybe they're saving that for later down the line. I'm not sure exactly. But, uh, yeah, really good match, really good stuff. No complaints uh, on my side. Ten, I was about to say 10 out of 10, not really a 10 out of 10. Uh, but yeah, I also wanted to quickly mention the 619 or the Swiss 19, uh, because the guy is so big, it looks really, really awesome. Uh, and then the uppercut on the outside as well, I wanted to quickly say that was really awesome with the ch- running all the way around. Uh, and then I'm gonna forget to mention it, but there was a segment backstage with Angelo Parker, Matt Menard, and, um, uh, Daniel Garcia, where Daniel Garcia cut a promo on uh, Wheeler Yuta talking about winning his title and taking his title, and if he took his personality, he's going to take your title or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but Daniel Garcia looks good, growing his hair out a little bit. I think it suits him for sure. And then, uh, but before that, Angelo Parker and Matt Menard, uh, Angelo Parker whipping out the comb, and Matt Menard being like, "Relax, Tony. It's just a comb." Just like as if it was a knife. Just good stuff. Uh, these guys are some of the best assets from uh, the, that AEW has gotten from WWE uh, 2.0 or better known as Ever Rise and NXT. Um, and then, guys, it was the quarter hour, and you know what that means. Anna J versus Serena Deeb. It was women's uh, wrestling time in AEW. Uh, I didn't know Anna J. It was her hometown match, and she actually lost. That was a surprise to me. We don't usually do that in AEW, but every now and then it is good just to keep things, um, just to keep things unpredictable. But yeah, this, this was kind of the down of the show for me. What a surprise there. It was the quarter hour, but, um, my problem with this match was Serena Deeb is just like years ahead, uh, and not just years, just, just decades, millenniums ahead of what Anna Jay can do in the ring. Everything Serena Deeb did look so smooth, and everything Anna Jay did I thought looked so clunky. It was it was distracting. Uh, you could just tell that as a professional wrestler, Serena Deeb was on such a different level than Anna Jay. And yes, it is Serena Deeb's job to carry someone like an Anna Jay through one of these matches, but I don't think it was a lack of carrying. I think it's like the lack of... Uh, talent really not talent that's not what I mean the lack of reps that's a better word for it the lack of reps that Anna Jay has had because she's definitely got a lot of talent and she's certainly really over Uh, and that's what matters at the end of the day you got to be over um but uh because she seemed more over than Serena Deeb was I know it was her hometown but still um but yes Serena Deeb just looked like she outmatched uh Anna Jay and not in a professional wrestling match kind of way but just in a talent in the ring kind of way and um and it was distracting for me throughout this match but Serena D did get the win with a serenity lock uh she got the submission on uh Anna J and um after the match uh I think she kept the serenity lock on the commentators did a great job of uh, demonstrating all the damage that that could actually cause and how vicious of a hold it was and um Martinez comes out, makes a save because they've got their match at Death Before Dishonor. And you know what? I hope Serena Deeb wins the title. As much as I love Mercedes Martinez, put a title around Serena Deeb's waist, even if it is a Ring of Honor title. But yeah, some of the transitions that Serena Deeb did in this match looked so smooth, it was unfair. Some of the submissions she pulled out of, like, from where? There was this one where she was, like, sitting on Anna Jay's, the back of her neck, and pulling her hands, like, uh, Serena Deeb. I am a Deeb fanatic, you guys. Serena Deeb is so good in the ring and is so talented and really makes technical professional wrestling. You know what? Give me Serena Deeb versus Zack Sabre Jr., please. I would pay money to watch that match. Um, And then, guys, moving on to the main event, which was the triple or nothing AEW World Tag Team Championship match. And what do you know? A match with Swerve in Our Glory, Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs, and the Young Bucks was absolutely mind-blowing, out-of-this-world amazing. Five stars for me, guys. I, I don't do the star ratings, but five stars for me. Ten out of ten. Non-stop action right off the rip. Um, really, a lot of emphasis between Strickland and Lee on a... Uh, the possible teases of the breakup and instead we got the no pun intended except pun very much intended we got the swerve the swerve in our glory um because we did not end up breaking up the tag team we actually ended up giving them the win but yeah i if i tried to lay out all these 
things that these guys did in this match. I wouldn't even be able to get all the highlights. Um, there was a backflip off Keith Lee, fight forever chance. There was um, a bulldog frog splash, or excuse me, a bullfrog splash, as Jim Ross said, from uh, uh, Powerhouse Hobbs on to Keith Lee. Uh, the beginning of the match between the Bucks and Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee, where Nick Jackson and Swerve Strickland were doing flippy dippy, this, that, backflip, kick ups, jumping out of the ring, jumping back in the ring, arm drags, the uh, stuff on the top rope with, um, with Swerve, uh, no, excuse me, with uh, Nick Jackson and uh, Ricky Starks was really amazing. And then Lee. Keith Lee doing a senton over the top rope, and then obviously uh, Swerve Strickland hitting his finisher on uh, Ricky Starks and getting the pinfall, defeating the Young Bucks and Starks and Hobbs to win the titles. Yeah, uh, what a mouthful, what a match. Something I'm definitely going to go back and watch again because the feel-good moment, it's the way AEW builds these throughout the match. Like, Because if I went into this, Swerve in Our Glory was the last people I thought were going to win this. Maybe Starks and Hobbs, maybe, but I really thought the Young Bucks were going to retain. I thought we had a match with FTR at All Out possibly happening. Maybe we're going to have that match anyways. But I thought we'd have a main event match between maybe, uh, not main event, but uh, the co-main event match between uh, FTR and the Young Bucks. Though it might deserve the main event slot. However, apparently that's not the direction we're going in because we had uh, Swerve in Our Glory taking the victory here. And a nice swerve. I, a nice, I can't with the pun. A nice swerve, though, really, because every now and then AEW uh, can do this where it, it, and any wrestling promotion where you really don't know who's going to win. You really go into the match thinking you know who's going to win, and then you're so totally wrong. And throughout the entire match, too, they bought, they got me on so many near falls. There was a great spear by Ricky Starks that got me on a near fall on Swerve Strickland. So many awesome near falls. There was the uh, Meltzer Driver, or whatever the heck it was. Uh, and another new fall, near fall, and the uh, kick out from the title belt shot, uh, and then the weird little tease too between Strickland and Lee, and all that stuff. Just so many teases back and forth here, there, and everywhere. Really, really an amazing main event, an amazing show overall. I really enjoyed it, you guys, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I hope you enjoyed this AEW Dynamite review show. I know we've been doing a little quick forms lately, but I like this. I like kind of speeding through stuff. Let me know on the Twitter at Mimi Burris if you'd rather me do a week in review or you want me to keep doing a Dynamite review. Maybe we can finally one day get Zach to do a Zach Smith, our NXT host, to do the uh, AEW Rampage review. Who knows? But that's, uh, that's all for me, guys. With all that being said, I hope you all have a run- wonderful rest of your week, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.